Myself, Dr. Gunjan, and as you can see, today we'll be discussing menopause and the basics around it. Now, what do you understand by menopause? It is basically the cessation of the periods for more than 12 months in a row. Continuously for 12 months or more, if the periods are absent, then we call it menopause. The most common age group for this menopause is around 51 years. And in India, there is a trend of menopause at a lower age and that is 47 years. So if we talk about a range, then it is from 45 to 55 years of age. This is the common age of menopause. And the period from 39 to 51 years of age is considered the perimenopausal period. The period just before the menopause. Now, if this menopause occurs before the age of 40 years, then we call it premature menopause. And this is seen in cases of premature ovarian insufficiency. And if the cessation of the periods have not occurred even till the age of 55 years, and the periods are continuing beyond the age of 55 years, we call it late menopause. Now here you have two important facts that you need to remember that if the menopause occurs before the age of 40 years, it is called premature menopause. And if there is no menopause even after the age of 55 years, then we call it late menopause. Now coming to the basic pathophysiology of this menopause, and we know in menopause, the eggs will decrease, the number of eggs in the ovary decreases. So there will be no more follicles in the ovary and the follicles which are left out even they become resistant to the gonadotropins. They become resistant to the action of FSH and LH. And as a result of this, what will happen? No follicles in the ovary, so no granulosa cells. And the follicles which are left out, they are resistant to gonadotropins. So the follicles will not grow. The follicles which are left in the ovary, they will not grow because they are resistant to the action of follicle stimulating hormone. So folliculogenesis will be impaired. And as a result of this, there will be decrease in the levels of estrogen. The follicles are not growing, so they will not release estrogen. So there is decrease in the estrogen levels. And it is because of this decrease in the estrogen that all the menopausal symptoms occur. So the pathophysiology of menopause, it rests around this decreased level of estrogen. And whatever estrogen is there in the menopausal females, it is in the form of estrone. This is the most common estrogen in the menopausal period. Then if the estrogen values, they are less than 20 picogram per ml, then this is diagnostic of menopause. So estrogen levels less than 20 picogram per ml is diagnostic of menopause. Now the second thing that happens that no more follicles are left out. So there will be no theca cells and thereby there will be decrease in the androgen levels initially. And this will lead to decreased libido also one of the symptoms of menopause. Now the number of eggs have decreased and the eggs which are left out, they are resistant to the action of gonadotropins. No folliculogenesis is occurring and there will be no ovulation subsequently. Now no ovulation, so there will be no corpus luteum formation and it is this corpus luteum which releases progesterone. So no corpus luteum, there will be decrease in the levels of progesterone. Now, because of decreased estrogen and decreased progesterone, there will be amenorrhea. Because we know that for the menses to occur, the estrogen levels should rise. It will lead to the proliferation of the endometrium. Then the progesterone has to act on that endometrium. And subsequently, when the levels of this estrogen and progesterone, they decrease, then it leads to menstruation. So if the levels of estrogen are decreased, levels of progesterone are decreased, then there will be amenorrhea. And when this amenorrhea persists for more than 12 months, then we call it menopause. Now, we know that this progesterone, it has a negative feedback action on the LH. So, if the levels of progesterone decreases, there will be loss of that negative feedback action on the LH and thereby the levels of LH will increase. So, in menopause, LH increases. Now, this increased LH levels, it stimulates the stromal cells of the ovary to release androgen. Now, in postmenopausal females, the major source of the androgens is the adrenals and they are also secreted from the stromal cells of the ovary. Now, they secrete mainly two types of androgens, the androstenedione and the testosterone. In fact, the major source of this androstenedione is the adrenals. In the adipose tissue, under the action of enzyme aromatase, this androstenedione it is converted to estrone. 
and the testosterone it is converted to estradiol. So, in the adipose tissue under the action of enzyme aromatase this androstenedione it is converted to estrone. Thereby in adipose tissue the major hormone that is produced is estrone and thereby in menopausal females estrone is the major estrogen in the body. Now, we have seen that in menopausal females the estrogen level decreases and in fact this is the major mechanism behind all the menopausal symptoms. So, let us see what happens as a result of decreased estrogen in the menopausal females. There will be dryness in the vagina because we know that it is under the effect of this estrogen that cervical mucus is secreted. So, cervical mucus will not be there and thereby it will lead to dryness in the vagina and this is called senile vaginitis. Now, subsequent to this decreased estrogen level, the bone mass also decreases, thereby leading to osteoporosis. So, let us see the basic mechanism behind this. Now, this estrogen is very important hormone for the bone mass. Why? Because it decreases the sensitivity of the bone to parathyroid hormone. And what does this parathyroid hormone do? It causes bone resorption. So, if there will be decreased sensitivity of the bones to parathyroid hormone, so there will be decreased bone resorption. Similarly, they also increase the production of calcitonin and this calcitonin, it inhibits the bone resorption. So, again, it will decrease the bone resorption by increasing the production of calcitonin. Then it increases the overall calcium levels in the body. How? By accelerating the calcium absorption from the intestine and decreasing the calcium excretion in the kidney and it majorly increases the osteoblastic activity, the bone forming activity osteoblastic and decreases the osteoclastic activity that is the destruction of the bone that decreases. And how does it do this? The osteoclasts that is the bone destroying cells in the body, they express rank on them and the osteoblasts they release rank ligand, they produce rank ligand. And it is the interaction between this rank ligand and this rank which overall leads to the final pathway through which bone resorption is regulated. And this rank ligand, it binds to the rank present on the osteoclast and thereby it controls the differentiation, proliferation and the survival of the osteoclast. Now, let us see what is the role of estrogen in this. The estrogen, it releases osteoprotegrin, OPG protein. And this OPG, it inhibits the rank ligand. So, if there will be no rank ligand, it will not interact with the rank and thereby the proliferation of the osteoclast, it will decrease and thereby the bone resorption will decrease. Thus, this estrogen, it prevents osteoporosis and increases the bone mass. So, if it is decreased as in cases of menopause, so osteoporosis will increase. Now, this estrogen, it has a negative feedback action on the FSH. So, no estrogen, so no negative feedback on the FSH and thereby the levels of FSH will increase. Again, this is one diagnostic feature in cases of menopause. Then decreased estrogen also increases the chance of heart disease. Now, this estrogen, it is also responsible for the elasticity of the skin. So, in cases of menopause, when the estrogen level decreases, so there will be thinning and loss of elasticity of the skin and thereby leading to sagging of the skin. So, this was the basic pathophysiology. Now, coming to the diagnosis of menopause. The first and foremost important thing is that the patient will have cessation of menses for consecutive 12 months and along with the cessation of menses, she will start having the menopausal symptoms and typically in that she will have hot flushes and night sweats. In fact, these hot flushes, they are present in 80% of the females of menopause. So, they are the most common symptoms of menopause. Then coming to the biochemical evaluation and serum estradiol levels less than 20 picogram per ml, they are suggestive of again menopause. Then increased FSH and LH levels more than equal to 40 international units per liter is again suggestive of menopause. So, the two hormonal levels which indicate menopause are serum estradiol level less than 20 picogram per ml and increased FSH and LH levels more than equal to 40 international unit per liter. Now, this increased FSH and LH in the menopausal females, it is excreted via the urine. So, in urine, there will be increased LH and FSH levels and this is used for the synthesis of HMG, human menopausal gonadotropin, as the name suggests, human menopausal gonadotropin synthesized from the urine of the 
post menopausal females and this hmg if you remember we use in the ovulation induction why because it contains fsh and lh and the levels of both these hormones are 75 international unit in this hmg so i told you the most common the most important symptom of menopause is hot flushes and let us see how does this hot flushes occur what is the pathology behind this hot flushes these hot flushes basically they are the vasomotor symptoms what happens as a result of decreased estrogen we know that the basic pathology in menopause is the decreased estrogen so as a result of the decreased estrogen the negative feedback action on the gnrh is also lost and thereby it will lead to gnrh pulse secretion and this hot flushes they coincide with the gnrh pulse secretion and the patient experiences sweating anxiety palpitation if you examine her there will be tachycardia and this symptom is seen in 80% of the menopausal females and basically the thermoregulatory and the gnrh center in the hypothalamus they are responsible in the etiology of hot flushes now apart from the thermoregulatory and the gnrh centers in the hypothalamus there are two neurotransmitters which are involved in the etiology of hot flushes and they are norepinephrine and serotonin so this is a question that was asked the neurotransmitters involved in the pathophysiology of hot flushes and they are norepinephrine 